Okay, so uh, thank you, Richmond. Uh, in this interview, we are going to go over your recent research and some of your experience as a PhD student at CUNY. A few weeks ago, you gave us a very instructive presentation about the over-the-counter trading network. And I would like to invite you to give me a short elevator pitch of the OTC market. And what are the major message that you like to convey with your research and why are they important? Um, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for having me. Um, yeah, the OTC market is a fairly complex uh, market to study analytically. Um, as you probably uh, was able to gather from, you know, uh, how the presentation progressed and um, the information in the paper. Um, and it's also quite large compared to centralized markets. It's uh, very large. Um, if you think about it, centralized markets typically trade just um, uh, equities, right? Stocks. And also maybe some uh, of the futures that trade on futures exchanges, uh, those are also centralized markets. Everything else is OTC, right? All the derivatives, um, you know, fixed income products, um, you know, um, all sorts of bespoke uh, instruments out there uh, are, are traded in the OTC markets. So, you know, compared to, um, the centralized markets, uh, I wouldn't have a figure off the top of my head, but very easily it could be, you know, close to maybe five to one or 10 to one, if I'm not, you know, mistaken, but I can give you specific figures uh, later on if we should. But um, that's to give you the scale, a sense of the scale of OTC markets, right? Um, and, um, but, as I said, analytically, it's quite complex uh, to study that market. And um, what that means is that um, it's the market is important and um, you know, we must learn about it, right? Uh, in recent years, uh, regulatory institutions such as the FINRA, uh, of course, where FINRA is where Trace resides and the MSRB, uh, it's another regulatory institution, and that's where I, uh, I purchased, uh, uh, I acquired the data for my research, right? MSRB is uh, primarily for municipal securities. Uh, they're the Municipal Securities Regulatory Board, and uh, FINRA regulates uh, most of the, all the other markets, right? <clears throat> so Trace, for example, resides within FINRA, and um, they are collecting uh, OTC market data, transaction data also for corporate bonds. And they have it also for securitized products, which is uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, as all sorts of asset-backed securities, uh, CMOs, which is collateralized mortgage obligations, which are essentially uh, derivatives of uh, mortgage-backed securities. So FINRA is doing a lot to help you know, um, bring transparency and analytical tractability uh, to OTC markets that has been missing uh, for some time now, right? Uh, so the regulatory institutions are helping a great deal to uh, help researchers be able to gain uh, 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 further uh, visibility and clarity to the workings of the OTC markets which didn't exist before, right? Um, now, with my research, um, the key uh, notion I wanted to convey uh, was that um, given the complexity of uh, OTC markets, sometimes you need um, you know, a pretty extensive set of tools uh, to help analyze these markets. And, uh, in my research, uh, um, uh, 
intended to show that um, computational statistics or what some people might also call applied probability or Bayesian inference or even statistical machine learning, um, choose what language you want to use to describe it. Uh, that uh, approach uh, can contribute a great deal in OTC uh, my, um, microstructure research and um, in a way that would share uh, detailed and insightful, you know, um, uh, lights on, you know, the workings of OTC markets. Because uh, what I was able to achieve with the research um, was, you know, to be able to estimate uh, a lot of parameters, over 2 million parameters in the model. And <clears throat> that's just the nature of the model. If uh, your toolkit won't allow you to estimate the size of parameters, given the sparsity of the data that I was working with, uh, you know, that's vis-a-vis -vis the number of parameters that had to be estimated. Then you would, at the end of the day, have to make compromises, trade-offs between what you can estimate and what you cannot. And when you begin doing that, then in the end, you know, you might find that you won't be able to get the full extent of the insights that you want to gain from the analysis you pursued, right? But thankfully, with um, Bayesian inference uh, through statistical machine learning, um, you would not have to make, you know, these types of difficult trade-offs, right? You're able to estimate a large range of um, uh, a huge number of parameters, right, in a model. And um, so that is what I intended to show um, with my research and um, also to show that the method is really good at yielding, you know, uh, useful, inside, uh, 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 insightful uh, results, you know. So, um, you know, and the result set was able to show that, um, you know, it, mo most of the main results are uh, sort of um, aligned with, you know, uh, intuitively how we would uh, think about OTC markets and also some other research that uh, some others have done. And um, so in that res respect, I think it went uh, uh, um, pretty far to demonstrate that. Um, you know, the techniques that are deployed uh, uh, successfully achieve the goal. Oh, so since you mentioned uh, about how big uh, OTC market is, uh, are there many individuals uh, uh, have access to OTC market? So in the, I mean, um, the better. players. Yes, so um, for example, in a data set that I used, right, um, the, the crux of the analysis was to focus on interdealer trading, right? And to, um, uh, to that end, to focus on uh, existing, pre-existing trading relationships, right? And uh, to establish that uh, a trading relationship pre-existed, I used transactions of size a uh, million dollars or more, right? And filtering by that criteria, I came down to about 1,398 dealers, right? In that, in that sample, right? Um, if you expand it further to all different sizes of trades, um, you end up with something close to about 3,000 dealers, right, uh, in the data set, right? Um, and that is for the municipal bond market. Uh, there are, you will find a number of small dealers, a number of, uh, a few very large dealers, and uh, some, some of which are quite central. And um, you, you will find some that are also 
well, my research didn't necessarily look to find uh, dealers that are state players versus national national players, but some research uh, have you know looked into that and identify that some dealers are state players versus uh, you know nationwide players, right? And so the market even gets segmented in that manner. But uh, for the purposes of my research, that didn't have particular relevance, you know, for the purpose that you know uh, the research looked at purely a transaction by transaction sort of um, uh, assessment, right? But yeah, that notion exists, right? So to answer your question, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of dealers in the market, and um, in if that is if you call. 1400 or 3000 a lot right and uh as far as investors there are a huge number of investors in the municipal bond market as well because uh you know a lot of people like to invest in municipal bonds for you know uh, the purposes of um you know the tax you know advantages that it gives people so um because of that it has uh, some peculiar uh peculiarities that makes it popular right so yeah there's quite a um quite a you know a large number of um participants in that market and even with the number of transactions that i looked at um i can give you some figures here uh regarding uh, total transaction sizes right um give me a minute let me coach you um very specific numbers um So for the total um, total number of transactions that had um, total number of transactions that were larger than fifty thousand dollars in par amount and had a price of greater than one dollar. Um, there was about uh, two two point zero seven trillion, right? Two point zero seven trillion dollars total volume, right? And and this is um, probably a segment, just a segment of the, you know, um, of the total outstanding bonds that traded in that period of the sample which is one year right so if you um if if we consider that and you know <clears throat> we haven't uh done an, an analysis of what percentage of the universe outstanding trades on any day right but typically you would expect that um uh municipal bonds and the nature of it were you know investors like to purchase it and hold in their portfolios you know it won't turn over very much in fact there is research that shows that um uh traders in that market typically you know um would trade primarily for liquidity needs and much less for information driven needs right and in fact, the results, the results in my empirical analysis also showed that to a certain extent were, you know, um, the total, um, you know, um, information driven sort of uh, uh, trading by, if measured by a standard deviation, uh, was about uh, 20 something percent. Right, I think 24, 26%, if I remember correctly, right? So, and the rest of it 
is just come on, come on valuations driven, meaning there isn't a lot of private information driven trading that goes on. It sort of aligns with the notion that, you know, a lot of trading will be driven by liquidity needs, right? So if our trading is driven primarily by liquidity needs, then there won't be a lot of turnover in the market, right? There won't be a lot of turnover in the market. And um, so if about $2 trillion of trading occurred within one calendar year, and there isn't a lot of turnover, then that two trillion is just a fraction of the total outstanding in that market, right? So that gives you a sense of the size of the municipal bond market, right? This yes. it sounds pretty large. Yeah, fairly large. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the next question, uh, as your next step of the research, uh, what are the major issues and questions in that specific field for further research? Um, so the, or the next, the next outstanding and most uh, in my, in my view, right? what I think would be most interesting um, to look at would be, for example, um, you know, trying to incorporate some, you know, uh, dynamic behavior into the network-based models, right? Um, because currently uh, there's the random search models, right? Of course, I mentioned in the literature that there are two main approaches to analyzing uh, OTC market microstructure, right? There's the network-based approach, and then there's a random search-based approach, right? The network-based approach essentially takes the view that, um, uh, you know, trading connections pre-exist, right? And they are long left, right? So an investor coming to the market is not coming to randomly search. He's coming specifically to certain already existing trading links, right? He comes to those trading links and trades at those trading links, right? And we saw the exogenous demand, right? Um, by clients as based on, you know, a link, it's a link by link based sort of concept, right? So, exogenous uh, demand or customers come to the market and they go to specific uh, pre-existing links that they know, right? And these are based on relationships that exist, right? Whereas a random search approach uh, takes the view that an investor coming to market is randomly searching for a dealer or another um, trade uh, uh, investor counterparty to sort of match his trading needs with. And then when, when he finds a match, then he can execute his trade, right? Um, we take the uh, formal approach, which is a network approach. But uh, it turns out that the random search approach sort of uh, incorporates uh, the dynamic behavior, you know, a lot more than, you know, the network approach does. The network approach, in fact, uh, does not incorporate any dynamic behavior as we know it now. <clears throat> of course, um, if you want to um, perceive the you know round by round bidding process as dynamic, yeah, that is um, um, that would be the extent to which the network approach incorporates dynamic information, right? But what would be nice to see is, you know, for example, dealers incorporating what knowledge they acquire from previous bidding rounds into subsequent building ra bidding rounds, right? That is missing in network-based, um, especially the one that I just worked with, right? Um, and I think 
to be able to incorporate um, dynamic behavior of this kind, um, you're probably going to be thinking about, you know, some dynamic programming, right? Or, you know, in continuous time or discrete time, however you decide to uh, formulate it. If it's going to be a theoretical, you know, framework, most likely uh, continuous time formulation would be uh, more amenable and uh, easier to incorporate into a, a theoretical framework, right? Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing I uh, suspect would have to be done to incorporate or to impart more dynamic behavior to network-based models, right? And, <clears throat> and to do that, I think ultimately uh, how you would judge, in my view, how you would judge to see that uh, that undertaking has been successful would be to see how this framework would take uh, a pre-trade transparency and you know, uh, evolve it to the stage where the actual transaction takes place. Right, because in OTC markets, remember I, I mentioned uh, subsequent rounds of bidding, right? Rounds of bidding take place leading up to the final trade, right? And these rounds of bidding start from what we call pre-trade transparency, right? Or quotations, right? If you think about it more in terms of, you know, um, uh, a manifestation of a transaction, you know, artifacts, that would be, um, uh, in a manner that uh, price reflects an executed transaction, right? Quotation will reflect pre-trade uh, transparency, right? I haven't seen a lot of work that has been done on that. I've seen one or two, you know, somewhere, right? That has looked at pre-trade transparency and, and, and in a manner that codes, right, help with, um, you know, uh, the pre-trade consideration. But um, so a, a good model that reflects dynamic behavior would be one that shows how, you know, the bidding goes from pre-trade, which is the quotations, and evolve all the way to the final stage where a transaction takes place, right? And how that dynamic behavior handles this evolution, right? In, within the network framework. That to me would be, you know, um, a model that adequately handles the problem, right? And um, uh, from what I see, it will not be a trivial problem at all. It will not be a trivial problem, you know. But, um, to me, uh, I, I think that probably will be close to the holy grail in this uh, in this area of research. But um, so that's one that's one area. Um, another area that I think would uh, uh, be interesting for further research by anybody that's interested would be uh, figuring out how to you know combine the various uh, mechanisms by which information asymmetries come about in the OTC markets, right? Of course, the network approach that I looked at uh, considers information uh, information asymmetries by from the viewpoint of um, private information, right? Um, of course, other mechanisms exist that consider information asymmetry from um, you know the distribution of risk preferences, right? Others incorporate uh, the distribution of uh, initial endowments, right? And all of these factors are, you know, are drive mechanisms which create information asymmetries, right? But um, how each type, how much each type accounts for the information asymmetry observed in the market, we do not know, right? And I haven't seen anybody done any work on that, right? And if a, a good model that does justice to this problem would be one 
that has these various types, various characteristics of information asymmetry combined in the same framework so that their, uh, uh, the, the various uh, uh, pieces, mechanisms talk to each other or share information or communicate in a way that, you know, their contribution, percentage contribution to the total information asymmetry in the marketplace balances out pretty much and they can evolve together, right? So um, uh, of, again, that would also not be an easy problem, right? But um, that would also be uh, quite interesting and quite revealing on how, you know, um, you know, our information asymmetries drive the markets and they come about and they play in the price discovery process and, uh, you know, uh, in the long run, help with, you know, market behaviors and also how market um, liquidities and price impact and market failure and all these things result, you know, ultimately uh, when, um, adverse you know events in the market take place right you know still the all uh, essential characteristics of how the markets work right so understanding these uh, sort of um, uh, very uh, fundamental components of price discovery will go a very long way to you know um, sort of giving us some very deep, very insightful revelations of you know, uh, price discovery and market microstructure. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, uh, all, all of them looks very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so my next question is, hmm, P PhD program is sometimes hard and students are sometimes struggling with introducing new ideas or other many obstacles. Like uh, it is also hard to find a balance between work, research, and studying coursework. Uh, as a senior student of Graduate Center, did you have any hardship of your PhD experience? Or uh, if so, how did you overcome it? Can you share it? Um, yeah, of course, I um, had several uh, very difficult obstacles to overcome, right? Uh, particularly in my case where I have been working full time in industry while also studying, right? Uh, at the height of my coursework, there were days when I could, I would very easily go for about two days straight without sleep, right? <laughs> and still have to go to work and function fine. And trust me, I managed to pull that off uh, seamlessly. You know, and um, I would uh, I would um, uh, indicate that what helped me get through it, and it was very difficult. It was not easy at all. Very very difficult. Uh, what helped me get through it is um, uh, determination, right? Um, and um, I guess what gave me the, the strong determination. Um, having a, a strong focus, right? Having a strong focus br brings about a strong determination. And um, uh, what brings the strong focus? Well, uh, having very strong interests, right? <laughs> so um, uh, how did I develop my interests in uh, studying OTC markets? Uh, it started when I was an MBA student at, uh, at Columbia University. Um, you know, I looked at uh, trading data from the currency markets and uh, I just could not help, you know, to uh, identify patterns that, you know, these patterns keep recurring, right? And I kept saying to myself, well, these must be driven by some very primitive explanations, right? Some very fundamental primitive explanations. This cannot just occur by chance, right? So that picked my curiosity very intensely, right? And uh, I wanted to learn everything I could find about, you know, 
OTC markets. And um, so that sort of um, drove a very strong interest in me, which um, drove me to eventually enroll in the, the PhD program to learn more about markets and uh, um, ultimately found myself, uh, you know, the natural logical place for me to learn about uh, primitive behavior that drive price formation is price discovery, right? Um, so that's how I was drawn to research and price discovery and market microstructure, right? So um, uh, I've had, um, you know, an interest that, you know, uh, was created, generated uh, from a long time ago and uh, kind of uh, created a lot of curiosity for me to learn something and that sort of created a very strong focus and, you know, strong determination to help me overcome some of these very difficult, you know, obstacles that I had to overcome, right? Yeah, thank you. And this is my last question. Uh, so uh, after you graduate, do you have any career plan? Uh, you already found a position. Do you have any advice for PhD students uh, what to prepare for the job market? Um, well, as, as uh, uh, must have mentioned uh, at the outset, uh, my case is quite atypical, right? Um, um, so I doubt it will have a lot of relevance to most current PhD students, but I'll try all the same, right? Um, like I indicated, um, I'm already in a position in industry where I intend to continue to work after school and I uh, also plan to continue to do academic work while I work in industry. And um, um, what advice I would um, give to uh, uh, PhD students would be that, you know, you sort of, you know, let your interests, follow your interests pretty much, right? That's um, one sure way to develop very strong passions for what you're doing and being passionate about what you're doing is one sure ingredient for success. I mean, it doesn't guarantee that you de will definitely be successful, but if you're not successful being passionate, then you, you would much less likely be successful being dispassionate, right? So that's definitely one thing I would uh, advise uh, PhD students uh, to do. So um, unfortunately, my you know, job situation would cannot serve too so much as a you know a guide for you know uh, uh, PhD students, but um, definitely you know following your passion should help a great deal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So thank you uh, so much for the interview and and also thank you so much for the presentation at the seminar. Thank you. My pleasure and uh, I wish you all the best too. All right.